now from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good evening. Great to see you. Welcome to the World Over Live. We've got an important and I hope engaging show for you this week. A global economic slowdown is upon us and there's economic unrest here in the U.S. as evidenced by the Occupy Wall Street movement. And faith has become an issue in the 2012 election campaign. We'll ask Father Robert Sirico, president of the Acton Institute, to unpack all of it for us. And we'll get into other news of the week. And violence has erupted against Christians in Egypt despite the much ballyhooed Arab Spring. What's becoming of religious freedom in Egypt and throughout the Middle East? Here to make sense of it are Nina Shea and Samuel Tadros of the Hudson Institute. Nina is also a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And she has breaking news for us that you won't want to miss later in the show. Get your questions ready, and I promise we will take as many as possible. Give us a ring, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. To get us started, here's the brief news from the world over this week. On Thursday, Egyptian Prime Minister Esam Sharaf met with Coptic Orthodox Pope Shenouda III in an attempt to calm rising tensions after a violent crackdown on a protest in Cairo last Sunday. Twenty-six people were killed, at least 20 of them, 21 of them Christians, as the army literally crushed what was a peaceful protest. Many of the victims were killed when armored military vehicles sped through crowds of protesters, Others suffered gunshot wounds. Nearly 500 people were injured. And it was the country's most violent outbreak since the fall of the Mubarak regime earlier this year. The army has denied responsibility for the deaths. Marchers took to the streets to protest an attack on a Coptic church in southern Egypt. Pope Benedict XVI, during his weekly public audience, asked for prayers that Egypt enjoy a true peace based on justice and respect for the freedom and dignity of all citizens. And after intense international pressure, Iran's Supreme Court on Tuesday ordered a retrial for a Protestant minister sentenced to death for renouncing his Muslim faith. Iranian state news reported that the high court sent the case of Youssef Nadarkhani back to a lower court because of problems with the internal investigation. A husband and father of two, the 32-year-old minister, converted to Christianity at the age of 19 and therefore became the pastor of a 400-person congregation. He was arrested in 2009 and sentenced to death on a conviction of apostasy. Just two weeks ago, Nader Khani refused four times to renounce his Christian faith and revert to Islam in consecutive court hearings. His renunciation would have nullified the death sentence and set him free. More on the plight of persecuted Christians in the Middle East later in the show. And the government of Ireland has rejected a call by the United Nations for the country to legalize abortion. As part of a periodic review of member states, the Geneva-based UN Human Rights Council made 126 recommendations to Ireland about everything from abortion to prison overcrowding. Ireland accepted approximately half of the human rights recommendations, but rejected all suggestions to legalize abortion. They did, however, embrace the recommendations to make contraceptive information available to preteen children and will consider changing the legal definition of the family as enshrined in the Irish Constitution. It also agreed to reconsider the right of religious employers who refuse to hire employees who reject the teachings of their faith. Ireland is scheduled to get back to the UN Council in March. And here in Washington, on a largely party-line vote, the Republican-led U.S. House of Representatives on Thursday passed the Protect Life Act the bill would amend President Obama's health care law by barring federal subsidies, subsidies for any health insurance plans that cover abortion. The bill also provides legal protection for hospitals that refuse to perform abortions. A similar bill passed the House in May. It is, however, blocked by the democratically-led Senate. The same fate is expected for the bill. 
the Obama White House has also promised a veto. And top Catholic leaders in the U.S. have issued an open letter calling for the rejection of the Obama administration health care mandate for contraceptive insurance coverage. The mandate being implemented by the Department of Health and Human Services under powers granted by the new health care law requires that virtually all health insurers provide free contraceptives, including sterilizations and drugs that cause abortions. The statement asserts that the HHS rules would harm access to health care by putting Catholic providers in an untenable position. It insists that the rule violates the long American tradition of respect for religious liberty and freedom of conscience. The statement appeared as advertisements in two D.C.-based publications for political insiders, The Hill and Politico. The signatories, 20 in all, include the heads of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, Catholic Relief Services, the University of Notre Dame, Catholic University of America, the Knights of Columbus, the Alliance for Catholic Health Care, and the Catholic Medical Association. Meanwhile, at a NARAL pro-choice America luncheon, HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius told the abortion rights group that the Obama administration is fighting to ensure that abortion will be covered in health care plans. She further accused Republicans of attempting to roll back 50 years of progress in health care for women, saying, we are in a war. Sebelius received warm applause from NARAL when she touted the aforementioned HHS mandate for free contraceptives. And on Sunday, the rector and members of St. Luke's Episcopal Parish in Bladensburg, Maryland, were received into the Catholic Church. Cardinal Donald Whirl of Washington formally welcomed the converts at a mass celebrated in the crypt church of the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Fifty-eight of St. Luke's members, including the pastor, were confirmed and received First Communion, with another ten members returning to the Catholic Church. Cardinal Whirl called it a truly historic moment. St. Luke's is the first former Episcopal parish in the United States to be received into the church as part of Pope Benedict's outreach to disaffected Anglicans. The community intends to become part of an ordinariat of free-floating dioceses when one is established by the Vatican in the United States. Until that time, St. Luke's will be under the care of the Archdiocese of Washington. And finally, sermons, samba, and seven massive birthday cakes. That's how Rio de Janeiro celebrated the 80th anniversary of the world-famous Christ the Redeemer statue. Rio Archbishop Orani Joao Tempesta began the festivities with Holy Mass. Archbishop Tempesta said the iconic statue has become an international attraction, not only because of its beauty, but because of the universal appeal of Christ's lessons and blessings. The church erected Christ the Redeemer on, on Cor Corvado Mountain overlooking Rio in 1931, but it didn't become an official sanctuary for worship until its 75th anniversary. Archbishop Tempesta suggested that thousands of more pilgrims and the Pope himself will likely visit the statue when Rio hosts World Youth Day in 2013. And the New York Times bestseller of The I Zing, America's Cultural Decline from Muffin Tops to Body Shots, my recent collaboration with Laura Ingram, is still available. It makes a great Christmas gift, by the way. And I received a zing this week from a nun that I wanted to share with you. She was aboard a bus when a young man entered wearing earbuds. Now, remember, a zing is kind of a cultural critique that you, you get involved in and turn around for the better. She wrote... We had a free concert for five minutes, which did not seem to please anyone, sister wrote to me, because the guy had earbuds on, sort of in his own little world. Then she took action. She wrote, when the words of the song he was singing became outright offensive, cursing God and defaming women, I got up and tapped him lightly on the shoulders. We can hear you, she said. Once more, she repeated herself, motioning to those around her, we can hear you. He seemed totally dumbfounded that anyone would say anything about his concert. Thank God the young woman next to me, Sister Wrights, then spoke up. Have some respect, the young lady added. Eventually, the fellow became quiet, and for the rest of the ride, he sat there in silence, still in shock. For that zing, Sister J, who shall remain nameless, will get a signed copy of a V.I. zing. If you see a cultural outrage, zing it. 
Or better yet, send a picture along to RaymondArroyo.com. You might win a signed copy of Abdi I Zing in the coming weeks. And it's still available in bookstores and at RaymondArroyo.com, so check it out. Up next, Father Robert Sirico joins us to comment on the latest headlines and cultural stories of the week. And we'll take your calls when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond DeRoy. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Economic unrest seems to be the order of the day, both in the U.S. and abroad. The European markets are wildly fluctuating, with countries like Greece on the brink of financial ruin. The Occupy Wall Street protests are spreading to multiple cities, New York, Boston, L.A., New Orleans, and even here in D.C. What's really going on? To discuss this and much more is Father Robert Sirico, the president of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a regular World Over contributor, Father Sirico. Great to be back. back. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. Now, let's start with this EU turmoil. I mean, yes, it seems yes. all of Europe is in the throes of this yeah. uh, instability. And just to paint the picture for people, uh, Greece is facing a default. There's right. already been a $400 billion, there's $400 billion of debt sitting there. Right. And what they've done is raise and increase benefits. They didn't raise taxes. Um, and, and, and you've got these benefits going out and a population contracting. There have right. been several bailouts to, trillion, to the tune of trillions of dollars. Right. What is happening there and what will be the effect, do you think, on the European markets? Well, uh, this is a real threat to the whole uh, concept of the EU. Mm -hmm. And there's a great resentment uh, coming out of Germany, which is paying, mm -hmm. uh, I think, 25% or more. Right, a of, quarter of uh, the bailouts. A quarter of the bailouts. And... Uh, People are saying, look, I, I, I work, I save my money, and now these people are living high on the hog. Uh, and they've just been acclimated to these kinds of things. So the expectation and the politicians have been promising these benefits. So it's a real intractable situation. In a way, it's a, a, a microcosm of what's going on here as well, hmm. and globally, of course. And if I were to put it on a bumper sticker, I would say that it is the fallacy that people can live at other people's expense indefinitely. Yeah, is, that the, is it a wake-up call, do you think, for Europe? I, I hope it's a wake-up I mean, call. It would, then they'll die in their beds if it's not a wake-up call. Yeah, France, Britain, uh, Ireland, there's a lot of uh, talk yes. about pulling out of the EU, to returning to returning to their own currency, because they fear, with the banks sure. in Germany going right. down and, and some in France unstable because of these bailouts to Greece, Precisely. Uh, the, you the whole can't system could keep collapse. living off of the capital. You have to create. You have to produce. Mm -hmm. It's not all about redistribution. Milton Friedman. It's going to be interesting to see if Milton Friedman's prediction comes to pass. Which was what? That the uh, the uh, euro would uh, collapse at its first crisis. Hmm. And this may be what we're seeing. We'll yeah, see if he no. was right. Well, you see the EU candidates being thrown out yeah. all over Europe, in Ireland, in Germany. I mean, right. uh, you know, the, it's a massive political upheaval. What we well. need to do is make a distinction between what's happening in the EU because of mm -hmm. all of the spending and debt and, and right. all the rest of it, and the idea of open markets within Europe and open mm -hmm. borders within Europe so mm -hmm. that people can trade and travel easily. This is a good idea, but what has happened is that they've taken the principle of subsidiarity and turned it on its head. So that mm. anything the centralized government doesn't want to do, they'll leave it to the local governments. If you have a question, 1-800-221-9460 is the number here in the U.S. And for you people who might be in the EU, uh, over in Europe, 205-271-2980 is the number. Or world over at EWTN.com. We will get to your questions as soon as possible. How is population and population control bound up in what we're seeing in Europe? We've got the, the UN right. uh, that, that's, that pays out foreign aid. Yes. And uh, as we heard in the headline segment, part of that is these recommendations to 
approve abortion, make contraceptives and sterilization Euthanasia now. available. Yep. Well, there has been a whole philosophy of what I call humanophobia in the mm -hmm. UN, which is derivative of this whole notion that the pie is static. I've explained this many times yep. on the program. And so the more people you have eating at that pie and this presupposition. A limited style, pie. Uh, you, you have to eliminate people eating the pie rather than thinking about growing the pie. Mm -hmm. That is productivity. And so especially when you have the kind of social security systems, and ours is not very dissimilar to some of these, that depend upon more and more young people supporting older people, right. and you don't have the younger people, then the pressure comes from the UN in this recent uh, mm -hmm. attempt to get nations to uh, enact, as a matter of human rights, euthanasia. So it's basically inviting grandma, grandpa, to consider the common good by stepping off the planet. Yeah, and going down uh, the hospice chute. It's, it's, it's just too expensive mm -hmm. to support you, and then there's that money that you've saved that could be used for other things. Right. Yeah. No, but again, this is dangerous. just eating away at the, the, the root rather than finding the solution to mm -hmm. the problem, which is economic productivity. Let's talk about what we're seeing here in the United States, which is bound to this question of economic yes. Uh, yes, productivity and equality, yes. social justice. We see this uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. It started in New York. Four weeks it's been there. It's spread all over the country. What is this? No, uh, you tell me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, there is a, a fascination with abstractions. They want mm -hmm. communism. They want to eat the rich. Now, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just reading some of the signs or hearing what the yeah. people are saying. They want world peace. They want all of these things, but they don't have any core philosophy, any core program. It's just all vague set of abstractions. Now, it's being aided and abetted by many people who want to foment the kind of discontent mm -hmm. and, frankly, class struggle that has been going on within the halls of uh, the Capitol. Well, it seems to be an anti-corporate, anti-rich yes. movement, but right. it's very amorphous. And I, I have to tell you, I have friends on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, what, she was taking her daughter to school, picking her daughter up from school the yeah. other day when this march came to the rich section of, of New York. And uh, she was scandalized because you yeah. had, you know, topless protests. It's going to look like one of these Castro Street parades from San Francisco yeah, going yeah. on in Wall Street. No, no, it's, 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 and it was jarring to children coming out of school, you can imagine. It's a complete challenging of any kind of order, authority. Mm -hmm. It has anarchistic uh, tendencies mm -hmm. within it. It has a visceral hatred for capitalism, for the free market. Uh, and Wall Street uh, emblemizes this. They are crying there is an inequity. You have, the, you have this very small group of w rich people who hold all the wealth, 85% of the wealth held by this tiny sliver of the population, and all these other people. And we've got to find yeah. some way to balance the scales, uh, to create some sort of equity here. You would say what? Isn't that a moral? Is that a moral obligation to create some sort of economic equity? No, I don't think economic equity is the, the real question. What we care about most is the vulnerability of the poor. Mm -hmm. It's not the gap between the rich and the poor, it's the, the floor. Mm -hmm. That is, how well are the poorest and most vulnerable people living? Mm -hmm. So the, the fact that Warren Buffett has less money than Bill Gates is not the moral dilemma. The mm -hmm. gap is not the moral mm -hmm. dilemma. And I think they're focusing on the wrong question. The question is not how to redistribute money, but how to create it. And let's remember that all of that money you talk about with the various percentages of rich people owning uh, is all invested, for the most part, is invested, only a fraction of it is spent on personal consumption as, as compared to what they actually own. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of it is invested in businesses. And all of the Wall Street portfolios are serving people through their uh, retirement portfolios. Remember, too, that 3% uh, of the richest people give 36% of all philanthropic mm -hmm. giving in this country. If so listen, if you eat the rich, you eat all of that as well. As well as the charitable giving. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you listen to these protesters, and I, I've gone through a lot of video, I spoke to some of them when I was last in New York. I was going to a bookstore, and suddenly here comes a mob, you know, them up the street, and they were there, so I talked to them. It seems there are a lot of college kids or yeah. recent college sure. graduates or sure. people going to college. One of the things they want is for someone to pay their tuition. They feel they're owed that, considering the obscene wealth in the, in the country, and they're asking for benefits to take care of them. Uh, what do you make of this? I mean, is this an entitlement mentality among the young in this group of protesters? It, it, 
it is not as uh, pervasive here in this country yet mm -hmm. as it is in Europe. But what did we just talk about with Greece? What did we just see with the English students rioting in London mm -hmm. and elsewhere? It's the same kind of mentality, this entitlement mentality. Uh, I remember when I was in England uh, during, uh, uh, we were going to have uh, the summer break, and yeah. I was talking with one of the students, and he said, uh, well, I'll do this or I'll do that, or, or if that doesn't work out for the summer, I'll go on the dole. Hmm. Just like that. Now, an American student would just not have said that. So mm -hmm. I don't think we've gotten that far. Maybe there's a greater radicalism on college campuses in mm -hmm. this country, but I hope we haven't gotten that far because we'll be in the basket case yeah. that Greece is. Now, 54% of people in a Time Magazine article in a survey they, they ran have a positive, favorable <clears throat> view of these protests. I'm not sure if they know what this is, but no. they, they have a positive view of well, it. Well, we're all frustrated with what's happening But is this an organic movement? Economic. Is this organic? I, I don't think it's organic. Well, I mean... <laughs> Judging by some of the reports of what's going on down there, it's very organic. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, but, we we, we uh, won't elaborate that, on that no, one. No, no, we won't. But. Um, no, it doesn't have a, a kind of coordinating idea, the way that the Tea Party movement is very often being compared to the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a coordinating idea. The Tea Party said less government, less bureaucracy, more economic opportunity, protect my right to private mm -hmm. property, and that kind of thing. This is very vague, and a few politicians are trying to make use of it, but I think they do it well, at great the danger. Danger. Union back. You've got That's union true. groups coming through That's in their true. union T-shirts, yeah. teachers' unions, and yeah. UFLCIO. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's uh, AFLCIO. There's clearly a a, a coordinated uh, element to this that yes. is, is 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 not grassroots. Yeah. And 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 a lot just for the party mm -hmm. atmosphere, the kind of the recalling the '60s. But it does beg the, the larger question: How do you approach poverty? How do we cure poverty? Now, you've recently launched, uh, I guess you could call it a movement to it is cure a movement. poverty. It's the antithesis of this uh, Eat the Rich movement. It's called Poverty Cure. Uh -huh. PovertyCure.org is where it's at. And uh, okay. it really uh, tries to look at what the real question of poverty is. We focus here on international poverty and the fact that aid does not, over the long haul, really help nations grow out of poverty. If they, mm -hmm. if it did, then 60 years ago we would have had a solution. Uh, I want to show people a little clip. Please this do. is from uh, PovertyCure.org, a little introductory video. Look. If the African nations today agreed together and say no more aid, I tell you they can grow slowly. But they can grow. Economic transformation in the long term comes from locally owned businesses. We need to transform our good intentions into things that actually work, allowing these individual human beings to create value and prosperity for themselves. Entrepreneurship should become something that is the language and the life of our day-to-day -day people. Business is the normative way that people rise out of poverty. I've seen that. I've seen that through my business. Small and medium-sized enterprises are a critical part in the development process. Job creation, employers who provide income for families who can take uh, whole communities out of poverty. And it grows and grows, and we begin to drive the bottom of the pyramid the other way around. We flip it around because it is possible. That's a little um, introductory into uh, PovertyCure.org. Now, what is the essence of this? What, well, what, is the, what does this site do? It's a variety what is this movement of things. It's, it's a site. You go on that site. There are an incredible number of interviews by people working in the field, experts in the field. But it's a movement. It invites people to uh, poverty organizations to sign on to a statement of principles. It's a documentary. Uh, it is an effort to educate people uh, and we'll have a curriculum based on this that people can take to their churches, to their business mm -hmm. groups and everything, uh, to, to basically say that trade is better than aid, that uh, free enterprise is a better solution to systemic poverty mm -hmm. than all of the charitable giving you can imagine. As justified as that may be in certain mm -hmm. circumstances, the state-to-state -state aid empowers dictators and represses entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I, I want to shift gears a little bit, and it's a big shift, I know. Sure. Uh, this week, there was a huge flap over this pastor, Robert Jeffress. He yes. introduced Governor Rick Perry right. at a values voter summit here in Washington. 
and caused a huge fracas by suggesting that Mitt Romney, who is a Mormon, is a member of a cult. Listen to this bite. I want to get your reaction. Sure. The Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the world, has officially labeled Mormonism as a cult. Uh, I think Mitt Romney's a good moral man, but I think those of us who are born-again followers of Christ should always should prefer a competent Christian to a competent, to an, uh, competent non-Christian like Mitt Romney. What do you make of this uh, pronouncement? I mean, bringing, uh, I want to get to the, in a moment to the, the issue of injecting religion into the political yeah. race, but is, can you consider a Mormon Christian, or is it a cult? What does the Catholic Church do? Well, first of all, the word cult for a Catholic means something very different than uh, mm -hmm. what Pastor Jeffries has said here. I, I suspect that Pastor Jeffries would consider the Catholic Church uh, a, a cult. Oh, he does. He considers yeah. it, in okay. fact, a, a so. uh, uh, Babylonian mystery religion right. spread like a cult. He calls it the genius right. of Satan and a counterfeit religion. Okay. And, well, and something counter to the yeah. Word of God, even though the Word of God originated yeah. well, these in are, these papal are very, councils. Yeah. And I, I understand that Protestants protest the Catholic Church. I accept yeah. that, and we can have a good yeah. conversation. For a Catholic, a cult is a, a focus for worship. Mm -hmm. It's neutral. So you can have the cult of the Virgin Mary, the cult of Padre Pio, the cult of Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. So that is not necessarily a negative term. If you ask me, is Mormonism representative of historic Christianity? I would say it is not. And the Mormons claim that they are not representative mm -hmm. of historic Christianity mm -hmm. because they believe there was an apostasy in the first and second century. They believe the Catholics and the Protestants have apostatized from what was the true faith. Yeah. Uh, we, we believe that about the Mormon doctrine so that yeah. the Roman Catholic Church does not accept a Mormon baptism is a valid Christian baptism, whereas mm -hmm. we would accept, for instance, the Trinitarian formula of the Baptists. Right, because so, they don't accept, they don't have the same yeah. Trinitarian formula, and right. indeed, and they've got the second revelation. They've got the Book of Mormon, which is a right. uh, an addenda to the Bible. It, yes, exactly. It's another revelation of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, they would say. So, but the acrimony and injecting this into the political debate, I think, is where it all gets very, very foggy. Okay, well, let's get into that, because yeah. you, you now have Bill Donahue at the Catholic League wanting Rick Perry to deny announce this pastor, but he didn't choose this pastor to introduce him at this value summit, but the guy does support him. So Yeah, it's an awkward situation. Yeah. You, you you and I speak regularly. Uh, by the way, everybody on the road says to say hello to you. I was oh, just well, well, uh, in Toledo the other day. And I'd never charge them with being in a cult, so they're okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and so people get up and say things about you that are embarrassing or humorous or completely wrong, yeah. uh, and you're a little... This is high stakes, and yeah. so for this man, he should have been vetted. Um, you might have been able to predict this kind of comment, uh, and I think, uh, I think that uh, Governor Perry would do well to distance mm -hmm. himself and, and repudiate the remarks mm -hmm. in the way that uh, Senator McCain, McCain did, did mm -hmm. with Pastor Hagee. John Hagee, who was, who was very anti, yeah. virulently anti-Catholic, and yes, he but renounced, then, yeah. But then he had a nice conversation with Bill Dunahue. And, and anybody who talks to Bill Dunahue, <laughs> you know, he makes you an offer you can't <laughs> refuse. He's that's, a good New Yorker. That's right. He, he's he, very convincing, <laughs> right, Bill, right. Bill is. Very convincing. Um, is it fair game to bring up a candidate's personal faith and suggest that this is a reason to vote or withhold a vote from him? Well, I think if a candidate, for instance, is inconsistent, so they lack integrity, uh, a person who uh, makes a profession of some religious um, affiliation, but then is inconsistent, I think it's perfectly legitimate to point that out. We've pointed that out many times with regard to uh, Congresswoman Pelosi or uh, you know, other uh, you know, ostensibly Catholic uh, mm -hmm. people who are completely inconsistent. But it's right. the inconsistency there. But to say, well, because this person does not subscribe to the Nicene Creed, they are not capable mm -hmm. of being the Attorney General, uh, I think you have to. We, we're not electing the College of Cardinals here, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not. But, but it is. I, I mean, I do think it's valid to look at a candidate's personal belief, and more importantly than whatever religion they personally subscribe to, how, how passionate they, are they and, about these moral and issues? And how do they interpret it? Conscience, freedom of religion, right. uh, religious liberty abroad, places right. where the public policy intersects with morality. Those are, 
those are all very legitimate questions. Mm -hmm. I think that if you elect a candidate who believes in eating uh, children, then you, you need to point that out. This is inconsistent with public service. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the phones. Mike from New York. What's your question, Mike? Yes, Father. I'm wondering, is it time uh, for the Catholics and citizens of the United States to begin to push back with resistance that uh, is outlined in the compendium on social justice, given the government supports abortion all the way through to same-sex marriage, and led by our bishops and priests, I think we could bring the government to their knees if 70 million Catholics rose up against the government. Well, I don't think you're going to have 70 million Catholics, uh, you know, in agreement. I wish, I wish we did. Besides yeah. which, uh, I think if you read the compendium very carefully, uh, and uh, for instance, Pope Paul VI's encyclical, Populorum Progressio, it, it is the, very cautious about bringing about a political situation that would be worse than the situation we're in. Should we bring about, should we protest, should we make our voices known and our uh, sentiments felt? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the Bishops' Conference has begun to do that. They've taken one of a very deliberate step by forming this Commission for Religious Liberty because they've right. gone down a list of things uh, that indicate a prejudice against religion in the present governing mm -hmm. ethos. Yeah. And so I think that's the way to do it. I don't think we want to bring the government down. What we right. want to do is reform it and place it within its proper sphere. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you see the bishops trying to draw attention, particularly to these conscience precisely, issues. Precisely. Co issues of conscience, conscience clauses. This touches everything from uh, adoption services to charitable right. outreach to health care. Right. And the fact is the Catholic Church is a large Insurance part covered, of that. Yes, it is. I mean, we run the largest private social network in this country. Some of it has received government money at, at various stages. And this is, by the way, the risk of accepting mm -hmm. too much government money, because mm -hmm. when they cut you off, the whole right. thing falls apart. Now, Craig from Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Craig. What's your question? Hi, uh, Father. I'm just curious about how you reconcile what is your consistent defense of capitalism with uh, the Catholic social teaching of the church from rerum divarum to chantissimus annus. Or to veritas in veritate, caritas in veritate. I think if you read the social encyclicals, it's not just capitalism I'm defending, and I want to be real clear about that. It is what uh, John Paul II calls in uh, the encyclical you alluded to, uh, chantissimus annus, a certain form of free, the free economy. It is not mm -hmm. a... Uh, ruleless and governless, non-juridical, non-moral system. But it is a system that's rooted in private property, rooted in business, that has an ethical core. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, Holy Father Pope Benedict says in Caritas and Veritate very clearly is that it is not the market that is the problem, but the people who operate within the market and their lack of moral formation. Mm. Uh, one final email here from Michael in Pennsylvania. Uh, today, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 358, a bill that makes it illegal to use federal tax revenues for abortion of any kind, even via nationalized health care. Right. The bill may not pass the Senate with a veto-proof majority. Still, can you comment on what today's partial victory says about pro-life trends in the U.S.? Well, the, the trends are, are really going in our direction. Of course, the, the numbers of abortion are dropping nationwide. Uh, the uh, polling, the la last polling I've read of young people indicates a greater uh, sentiment uh, in favor of life. And in point of fact, when you really do the numbers on Americans themselves, even those who approve of abortion in certain circumstances do not approve of abortion in the second and even less in the third trimester. Mm -hmm. And uh, very few approve of partial birth abortion. So it's a matter of galvanizing, of talking this through. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is not just a Pyrrhic victory. I think uh, uh, what we've seen today is an important move. And I think the fact that the president uh, and certain people in Congress and Senate will have to put markers down now. Mm -hmm. And an election coming, uh, the consequences will play itself out. Yeah. Very good. Father Robert Sirico, good thank to be you with as you. always. For more on Father Robert and the work of the Acton Institute, visit acton.org. You can also visit Acton's new initiative on poverty at povertycure.org. When we return, we'll talk religious freedom under fire, literally, in Egypt and throughout the Middle East with Nina Shea and Samuel Tadros, 
of the Hudson Institute. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. My next guest is the director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute here in Washington for over 20 years. She's kept her eyes on the religious persecution occurring around the world. She served as a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom since 1999 to explore the recent outbreak of violence against Christians in Egypt and throughout the Middle East. Please welcome back to the show Nina Shea. And joining her this evening is research fellow. You can applaud. Go ahead. Uh, I don't want to step on your applause, Nina. And joining her this evening is research fellow at Hudson, an expert on the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic affairs, Samuel Tadros. He's also an Egyptian Copt. Sam, thanks for being here. Thank you. Great to see you both. Uh, I want to start with um, sort of how this happened. I'll start with Sam, and then, Nina, I have to talk to you about your perspective on this. Uh, Sam, w w we saw the headlines, 26 people killed, hundreds injured. Um, we are hearing, the, the, the army is saying, the military says it has no responsibility here. How much truth is there in that statement? None. We, we've all seen the videos that are posted on YouTube that include um, armored vehicles driving over people, that include uh, the army soldiers shooting on demonstrators. And more importantly, we have a video that has been uploaded on YouTube of one of the soldiers after the attack uh, claiming that he shot and shouting to the Muslim onlookers mm -hmm. that he shot a cop in the chest and the onlookers all clap and call him a man for doing so. Mm. So we have evidence of videos, of testimonies of people, both Christians and Muslims that were there, that indicate that the army definitely had a role in the attack. There's also a little piece of video. I want to share this with you. Now, this is a piece of video that happened before this Sunday event. Uh, what are we seeing here? This is a man that's sort of being brutalized by... Uh, are these members of the military as well? Cool, cool. Yes, these are indeed members of the military. Uh, what's very interesting in this particular video is that what will appear later as the officer in the red uh, cap trying to stop his soldiers from uh, continuing with the attack after the initial beating. Mm -hmm. And as we see now in the video. And what this is, uh, exposes, and very interestingly, is that the Egyptian military is not a professional military. It's a military con uh, that is of conscripts. Mm -hmm. And thus, those conscripts are a regular or are a normal reflection of Egyptian society mm -hmm. with all its problems, all its hatreds. Uh, Samuel, we were told when we saw the Mubarak regime overthrown, uh, from New York to L.A., we've heard nothing but love letters. The Arab Spring is upon us, democracy is here. And one imagined that democracy and religious freedom went hand in hand and the cops would flourish. What is happening and why is that a misnomer? What is happening is that um, the reading of this Arab Spring was mistaken from the very beginning, mm -hmm. that the assumption of a revolution being leading to democracy is a wrong assumption in it of itself. We've seen repeated stories of revolutions that have not achieved democratic regimes. Moreover, democracy as being defined now as elections does not result in religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Religious freedom is a value that we need to defend in regardless of democracy, we need to, to defend it even in countries that are working on democracy. Not all good things come together in this mm -hmm. sense. Uh, Nina, you are a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. You have been since 1999, uh, which means you're under the auspices of the State Department. The president, after this horror occurred, 26 people killed, hundreds injured, uh, literally military vehicles running them over in the streets, and a peaceful protest. He said, now is the time for restraint on all sides so that Egyptians can move forward together to forge a strong and united Egypt. Is that minimizing what happened here and who the guilty parties are? It's, it's much worse than that. It's really developing a moral equivalency between the victim, the persecuted, and the persecutor in this mm -hmm. case. And uh, it's a myth that both sides are to blame, that this was sectarian strife, that, that, that the Christians... And you have to understand, Raymond, that the, the Christians of Egypt, the Copts, 
um, are the largest Christian minority in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, once they're gone and they're extremely vulnerable, it, really it will be uh, the end of Christianity. The end of Christianity. Of in Two thousand years of Christianity in this region, and um, so. Uh, they were protesting when they were crushed on Sunday. They were protesting religious persecution. A church had been burned in Aswan in, uh, on September 30th. By whom? Um, radical Muslims, the Salafi, Wahhabi, uh, mm -hmm. uh, intolerant, fanatically intolerant and zealous mm -hmm. Muslims. Uh, not everyone. You know, not everyone in, in, in Egypt is like that. No, because some of the people a, marching with them at the protest were indeed Muslims, yes, sympathetic Muslims. Yes, and, and they have received some sympathy, um, a, a, including from sep, some sectors of the government. But there is this climate of impunity. When Christians are persecuted, no one goes to jail for it. And mm -hmm. this is what we're seeing with the um, Obama administration playing into this. Both sides have to shake hands now and restrain themselves, when in fact it was a situation of persecution. And continue. what is the administration doing now? And where is the State Department in all of this? Well, um, let me correct you. The, the commission that I'm on is actually independent of the State Department. We're a creature of Congress. But you report to, we this, report you to report the State, to the State Department. Department. And what we're trying to do, we're calling for, our commission is calling for an independent and an independent and thorough and open transparent investigation because mm -hmm. this rush to judgment that it was both sides fault is simply wrong and it's going to drive the cops out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the State Department it, it has been weak on this. They are more intent and more focused on trying to make friends with the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. trying to develop a relationship with them, seeing if we can work with them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been a disaster. The policy has been a disaster. We, they are one of our largest aid recipients in the world, mm. Egypt, is. Egypt and it goes to their military. And this is what we get. This mm. is what we mm. see is the persecution For of Christians. Billions of with dollars. Billions of dollars every year um, uh, going to the military and, and, and it's an untrained, as, as Samuel said, mm -hmm. completely untrained military. Where is the human rights training here? Where is the riot control training? Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, is this a good idea to engage the Muslim Brotherhood? Is it possible to create political ties between the United States and the Muslim Brotherhood, given what we've seen throughout the Middle East? It's obvious that the Muslim Brotherhood seeks to have this kind of engagement with the U.S. Whether this serves U.S. interests is very doubtful. Mm -hmm. While this organization might triumph in its struggle in Egypt, uh, U.S. interests would mean supporting those groups that are trying to, uh, to build a pluralistic, liberal society in Egypt mm -hmm. that helps uh, religious freedom and defends it. The Muslim Brotherhood is, of course, none of those uh, factors. They don't stand for any of these. They might show some pragmatism in their dealings with uh, the U.S., but that does not mean moderation. What happens to the Copts if you're looking at this situation in this hostile environment that is obviously dominated by radical Muslim forces taking, taking control of the government there? The immediate reaction of every Copt I have talked to is, is this Egypt going to be the Egypt of the future? Is it going to be a place that is welcoming to us as a community? Mm -hmm. Should we be leaving the country? We've already mm -hmm. seen indications of the beginnings of immigration, something mm -hmm. that's repeating the story of Iraq. Iraqi Christians. Mm -hmm. However, we've also seen this community standing to defend its right. Mm -hmm. Those youth that have stood and um, come out against the attack on the Aswan church in the south of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Those are Christians that are not going to disappear in silence. Well, and we should they say, are, these are, the, 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 the Copts are native to this land. This yeah. is their land. This is, where they're, this is where they've been for thousands of years. This is not, they, they didn't just arrive a few, uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. This is their native land. And to, to think of them expelled, and that's what this would be, as we've seen the Chaldeans in, in, in Iraq, in Iraq yeah. is, is such a grave crime. I mean, this is the cradle of Christianity in the world. Well, the word cop means Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a derived from the word Egypt. Mm -hmm. and, and the uh, demonstration that started out on Sunday showed these cops with crosses held high. Uh, very quickly, Syria, 2,900 Christians have been brutalized there mm -hmm. under Assad's purging. What's happening there? What are the prospects for the Christian community in Syria? We still don't know if the regime will fall there or not. The mm -hmm. regime's strength is still uh, evident. Mm -hmm. If the regime, however, falls, this would mean that mm -hmm. um, 
forces will be unleashed, the Muslim Brotherhood and other forces in Syrian society. How strong are they now, the Muslim Brotherhood? We, it's very hard to measure popularity in a totalitarian society, mm -hmm. so we don't know exactly how strong they are. We know that they're organized, that they have uh, mm -hmm. following, and that their ideas compete against a vacuum. I promised a little news. Nina, earlier uh, the, the United States Congress renewed the uh, United States Commission on International Religious Freedom because it was set to expire. The House passed a two-year extension. The Senate has shelved it. Tell us what do you think will happen with this commission that has done so much good exposing the world, not only people in the United States but around the world, to Christian and religious persecution around the world. Um, yes, we're in danger of, of having our doors shut on November 18th. The, as you said, the, the original uh, legislation that established us um, would have had us expired on uh, September 30th. Mm -hmm. There's a continuing re resolution that continues us with the rest of the government until November 18th. The House passed a bill that with 391 votes in favor of the commission, overwhelming support, 21 against. Mm -hmm. The Senate then took it up. The Democratic leadership there has now put a hold on it. There was a unanimous ex expectation of unanimous consent. It was not going to go to committee. It was put on the secretary, the Senate's desk. And now a Senate uh, Democrat in the leadership has put a hold on it. So I hope your viewers, mm -hmm. Raymond, will contact their senators, particularly if they have Democratic ones, and mm -hmm. say, support the Commission on Religious Freedom mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's about to close yeah, its doors. Yeah, this is a bipartisan thing. I mean, this is, this, is, this is human rights and religious freedom. Who could be opposed to that? And, uh, it's I mean, it's, quintessentially it's, American and expression of our culture. It's something so rare in government well, that we here, can talk here's about Here's my religion. question. Who's on the other side of this? Because I know you must have made a lot of enemies from some of these very wealthy regimes that routinely crush the religious freedom. We see the Vatican locked in a battle right now with China. Uh, China's our leaseholder. Is, 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 there, is there pressure coming from some of these countries that have been listed each year as countries of concern in the, in the religious freedom reports? Undoubtedly, and there's some of the, as you point out, these countries have a lot of money. Uh, so mm -hmm. you have China, you have Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe even India, we've been critical of them. So there's, um, we definitely have our enemies, but we also definitely have our admirers. And we have the um, downtrodden of the world, of course, that persecuted Christians and the Copts in Egypt and the Assyrian and, and Chaldeans in, in Iraq, mm -hmm. but also the Ahmadiyya uh, Muslim community in mm -hmm. Pakistan, uh, it, we, we've, Tibetan Buddhists in China, it goes on and on. Animists and Christians in, 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 in uh, Sudan. Ch in Sudan. I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, interestingly enough, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, and the Philippines have all come to us in this past year and said, we want to create the same kind of centers on religious freedom that you are. Mm. Tell us what you do, how you do it. So the rest of the world, as the rest of the free world is catching on, that this is a crucial issue mm -hmm. at a time when we're all seeing this uh, unravel in the Arab Spring, that's when the, the Democrats in the Senate want to shut us down. Mm. Troubling. Let's go to Maryland. Very quickly, Maryland in Florida, what's your question? Uh, yes, I wanted to know what we can do to, uh, because of this hypocrisy that's going on internationally in our country, where you see these people outside of Wall Street concerned about money, yet no one seems to be concerned about the horrendous raping or murdering of people just because they're Christians, just because they're in their homeland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, my question is, is kind of twofold, because people are so ignorant, they say that Jesus would be communist. And I have family mm -hmm. in Cuba, and I know for a fact that we couldn't even mention Christ or Christmas. Mm -hmm. You know, the yeah. first thing they do, the communists, is take away God and your faith, yeah. so that yeah. you do not know you have a God-given right to be free, prosper, mm -hmm. and have faith. Mm -hmm. So this kind of idiocracy and ignorance that's going on in our country we have to address it somehow, and even if we have to unite and go out there and, and address these people that, that are out there, you know. What's your question, Marilyn? Because I'm running out of time. I got but, one but what minute. do we do? What, how do we get together and get people to know exactly what's okay. going on and, you know, figure out something? Good. Thank you, Marilyn. Each, I'll give each of you 30 seconds to respond. Well, um, Marilyn, it's a great question. You have uh, the U.S. is the last best hope. Uh, actually. Uh, the U.S., there, there's nothing like the U.S. in the world today. Uh, we can bring other partners with us from the West, but the U.N. is not going to solve this problem. If the United States does not speak out for religious freedom, and by the way, Cuba and Venezuela is on our list of the Commission mm -hmm. of Religious Freedom. Sam? 
well, morally, it would be much appreciated by those cops that are standing for their freedoms and their rights to feel this uh, support from people in churches here, that the churches spread the message of what is happening to the mm -hmm. fellow Christians in the Middle East, in your churches, mm -hmm. in your communities. On the side of the U.S. government, we have to make sure that the U.S. government is in the money that it's allocating for democracy promotion in the region, taking into consideration the support for religious freedom and helping those mm -hmm. Christian minorities organizing themselves for the coming elections and their coming future. And indeed, the pattern that we've seen around the world, it usually follows that where there is religious freedom, then there is democracy. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily the other way around. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yet you still have people, I speak to many politicians and policymakers here in Washington, who believe in their gut. If you bring these democratic forms to the Middle East, somehow by osmosis, they'll become Americans. That's not the case, is it? No, and George Washington definitely didn't believe that's the case mm -hmm. in his farewell address. Mm -hmm. Very good. Nina Shea, Sam, thank you so much for coming and, and for yeah. all your work. And uh, we hope people respond and will uh, g take a look at your website, careful look, and uh, spend some time on this most important issue of religious freedom, not only uh, in, in our immediate vicinity, but around the world and in the Middle East. It's, it's a dire situation. For more about the Hudson Institute Center, for religious freedom, or to read Nina and Sam's columns, Samuel's columns, I'm sorry to call you Sam, uh, visit the website hudson.org. And before we go, remember the Truth in Life audio Bible is still available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. It is the only Catholic dramatized audio Bible available anywhere. Stacy Keach, Michael York, John Reese Davies, Julia Ormond, and many world class actors bring the Gospels to life as never before. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. I have a link there to the catalog at the top of the page. And as long as you're visiting, check out my Facebook and Twitter pages. They're linked on the left-hand side of the screen. And if you're looking for a great film this weekend, the spiritually uplifting movie The Way, starring Martin Sheen and Emilio Estevez. We had them on the show a few weeks ago. It opens wide this week in 25 cities, including Atlanta, Austin, Philly, D.C., and many others. Visit theway-themovie.com with theaters and more info. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. Thanks also for watching our 15th anniversary show last week. I received so many nice emails, and uh, thank you all for watching. We enjoyed putting that together for you. By the way, it's linked up on RaymondArroyo.com. If you missed that show, it's there. You can enjoy it on your own schedule. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye now.